thank you for joining us for Unite for Sites webinar about environmental toxins and human health. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Jennifer Staple Clark, and I'm founder and chief executive officer of Unite for Site. I will briefly introduce you to Unite for Site, review the webinar logistics, and then we will hear from our five expert panelists. Unite for Site is a global health nonprofit organization that promotes high quality care for all. We offer extensive global health and social entrepreneurship education programs. And our Global Health University program offers a free webinar series, including today's webinar. We also have more than 20 online certificate programs for students and professionals. Many students receive academic credit for completion of the certificates, and professionals often pursue the certificates for professional development purposes. The certificate topics range from a certificate in global health and a certificate in global health research to a certificate in environmental health. We have more upcoming webinars during the upcoming months as well, including a webinar that is scheduled for next month, September 27th, about health communications and social marketing. Additional educational opportunities for students and professionals includes participation in Unite for Sites annual global health and social entrepreneurship events, which focus on responsible global engagement. Our 14th Annual Global Health and Innovation Conference, which is the world's largest global health and social entrepreneurship conference, will be on April 22nd and 23rd, 2017 at Yale University. And this conference includes 300 speakers and more than 2,000 participants for a weekend exchange of ideas across all disciplines of global health, international development, environmental health, and social entrepreneurship. And the conference website and registration can be seen at uniteforsite.org slash conference. Unite for Sight also has healthcare delivery programs that provide care to patients living in poverty. We partner with phenomenal local clinics in Ghana, Honduras, and India as they provide patients in their communities with care in villages, slums, and refugee camps. And participants are able, have the opportunity to learn from local medical professionals about patient barriers to care and about effective strategies to reach the hardest to reach patients who are otherwise unable to access or afford care. And Unite for Sight has a phenomenal collaboration with these local partner clinics so that volunteers who are both students and professionals are able to travel abroad and work with those local doctors who are social entrepreneurs who are designing effective and innovative strategies to eliminate patient barriers to care. Now I will describe the basic logistics of this webinar. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. We have five incredible panelists, and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Each of our panelists will start by giving a two-minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their key guidance and lessons learned about environmental toxins and human health. And then we will dedicate the remaining time to your questions and answers, and we received many stellar questions by the question submission deadline, and then we selected the most common and most thoughtful questions to ask our panelists today. We also invite you to submit additional questions in the text box on the left of your webinar screen, and then we will select those questions to ask the panelists today as well. We also encourage you to tweet during the webinar, including your key lessons learned, by using the hashtag GHUWebinar, and you can see that hashtag in the webinar visuals on your screen. To begin now, we will proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order, I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Caroline Cox. Caroline, please begin by introducing yourself, your background and current role, and please share your key guidance and lessons learned about environmental toxins and human health. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, work with an organization called the Center for Environmental Health. It's a nonprofit in Oakland, California, and New York, New York. Um, I am the research director there. Most of my work focuses on what we call product testing, meaning that we're checking just kind of ordinary, everyday things that people buy and use all the time to see if they contain toxic chemicals. Um, and as far as lessons learned, I wanted to cheat a little and do two, um, and I'm going to sort of introduce them with some, uh, I guess, cliches would be the word. So the first one is um, the fox is guarding the hen house. Um, so with respect to toxic chemicals, many people assume that the government 
is testing chemicals and products for safety, but in fact, most health and safety testing is done by the same companies that profit from the sale of those chemicals or products. Um, the, the second lesson that I've learned is that um, we can have our cake and eat it too, uh, to use another cliche. Um, so lots of times people assume that we have to use toxic chemicals because of the functions that they provide for us or the benefits they provide. Um, but um, it turns out that um, really we are um, smarter and more creative and we can figure out better ways to do things. So, for example, um, we can have canned food without needing to use toxic chemicals in the cans. Um, we can make shampoo that doesn't contain cancer-causing ingredients, and it works just fine. Um, Lead-free purses are just as stylish and beautiful and functional as um, ones that contain lead. Like I said, we are smart. We are creative. When we try, we find safer solutions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. And Mika Leba, please introduce yourself as well and share your key lessons learned. Sure, um, and I'm so happy to be here and join in, in this webinar. My name is Nika Leiba, and I am the director of the science team here at the Environmental Working Group, EWG's a nonprofit research and advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. We also have an office in um, Ames, Iowa, and in Oakland, California. Our mission is to um, empower people to live healthier lives in a healthier environment. Um, and we do so by producing educational materials and resources or tools to help people choose safer products while also pushing for policy change. Uh, in terms of background, I've been here at EWG for 10 years. My background is in public health, um, and I have worked on anything from toxic chemicals in cleaners, personal care products, food, um, to... Uh, BPA and the, it runs the gamut. Lessons learned. The the biggest thing I've learned through the work I've done at EWG is the sheer power of consumer influence over what's on the market. Um, as Carolyn had said, uh, the the there is a lack of regulation uh, um, in terms of what's what's what chemicals are being used and. Um, the consumer has had such a great influence on changing that by demanding better products. If a consumer votes with their wallet, if they decide that they're not supporting a company because they're using ingredients of concern, that company is likely going to change their behavior. And so although we're not seeing a lot of change because of policy right now, we are seeing a lot of change because of consumer influence and consumer demand. So that's definitely one of the biggest things I've learned in my 10 years here. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Gerald Markowitz, please introduce yourself, yourself and share your lessons learned as well. Uh, sure. And it is really a, a great pleasure to be able to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, I am a professor of history at uh, John Jay College and at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, I have been writing, uh, along with uh, David Rosner at Columbia University, about um, the history of occupational health and the history of environmental health and the history of public health for uh, well over 30 years now. And in the course of that, we have done a tremendous amount of work on the history of toxins and what has been known about the dangers of uh, toxins um, by various industries um, in, during the 20th century. And I guess the key uh, lesson that um, I have learned from doing this work is the importance of um, what is called the precautionary principle. Um, and, you know, in the United States, uh, in the criminal justice system, we presume uh, someone accused of a crime is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but um, when we have uh, toxic chemicals, 
we take the very same uh, procedure. We assume that the uh, chemical is safe until it is proven unsafe. But the precautionary principle really uh, takes the opposite approach. The importance of uh, showing that a chemical is safe before it is uh, tested on all of us as uh, people using uh, that chemical uh, throughout our lives and waiting until people get sick um, before we act. So I think we need to change those priorities. Terrific. Thank you so much, Gerald. And Linda Weinstein, please introduce yourself as well and share your lessons learned. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm delighted to join your panel. Um, I'm Linda Weinstein, the co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, ADAO. And for those of you who I haven't met, we're an independent nonprofit dedicated to eliminating asbestos-caused cancers and respiratory diseases. Well, like most Americans, I never have really heard or understood the dangers of asbestos and trusted that our government kept us safe from toxins. But our world dramatically changed, and so did our knowledge, when my late husband was diagnosed with mesothelioma in 2003. Our daughter was just 10 years old at that time. And Alan fought a courageous three-year battle, and Emily and I stood next to him as he took his last breath. And it's shocking to know that 15,000 Americans die each year from these preventable asbestos-caused diseases while imports continue. And through my anger and grief with Alan's diagnosis, it it led me to co-found ADAO. After 15 years fighting fighting the ultimate David and Goliath battle to end this man-made disaster, I've learned three important things that I believe have helped us and our work. It's really the importance of collective activism, social media advocacy, and how strategic storytelling can all move mountains. It's monumentally exciting for me to see the impact on technology because we've been able to connect and share with organizations and institutions literally around the world, and our storytelling efforts have actually been recognized internationally. And, Jennifer, you give us a platform and a space with these webinars as well as your annual conferences really to connect, share, and engage. So thank you because you've been instrumental in the work that ADO has been able to do and efforts that we've accomplished. Wonderful. Thank you, Linda. And our final panelist, Catherine Thomas, please introduce yourself and also share your key lessons learned. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, works to bring the health voice to advocacy to address policies that will protect human health and survival from the gravest threats. Um, I'm actually a physician and was in practice for many years, so that I bring that perspective as well. And PSR has worked on this issue for over 20 years, um, both from a chemical toxics perspective as well as an air and water toxics perspective. So it's a very broad issue. Um, And the myriad of impacts from these toxins are really not known by many people, including health professionals, from miscarriages to small birth weight, birth defects, impaired intelligence, cancer, attention problems, et cetera from pesticides, air pollutants, plastic solvents. Um, There's just, you know, in the U.S., there's 30,000 pounds of chemicals per person manufactured or imported. Um, And just a few other stats, the 7 million people die each year, die each year because of exposure to indoor and outdoor air pollution. Um, So what is the solution? I, I... Boy, all the comments um, preceding mine are fantastic, and we all bring a different perspective. Um, I think it's important for us to change the mindset that it's not better living with chemicals, but it's better living without chemicals. Um, We've been brainwashed uh, to think that chemicals are going to make our lives better. Um, The second is we should have a major campaign against all fossil fuel, mining, burning, and waste because they are a major source of toxics, uh, not just when they're burned for electricity and transportation and heat, but also for their role in plastics production, 
pesticides and fertilizers. So the solutions that we need to find for climate change are markedly going to reduce our toxic exposure. Um, and lastly, regulation is essential. We are very pleased to pass the Lautenberg Act, but it's not perfect and it's going to be slow. Um, but it replaces a Toxic Substance Control Act that did nothing. Um, so we really need to push regulation in all the ways that people were speaking of already um, to move this mountain quicker. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to all of our phenomenal panelists. As you heard, they all have a wealth of expertise and guidance to share today. Now we will proceed with the question and answer session. As mentioned, we received questions in advance from you, our audience members, and if you have additional questions, please post them in the text box on the left of your webinar screen, and we will add additional questions to our queue today as well. Our first question is for Nika. What do you see as the biggest as the biggest barriers to the education and acceptance of the realities of environmental toxins for the general public? I think uh, we routinely see that one of the biggest barriers is the the delay in in cause and effect that can happen with exposures to environmental toxic chemicals. Um, with other chemicals, you may have an immediate effect, and so you know your brain is 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 programmed such that you would immediately avoid a certain ingredient. But with environmental with toxic chemicals in our environment, often the effect may not happen. If it's going to happen, it may not happen for years, sometimes decades. So, for example, um, uh, endocrine disrupting chemical, if you're exposed to it as a teenager, you may not see the effects until, until adulthood. Or sometimes it's even cross-generational, where it's the child of somebody that was exposed. So because of that delay, it's hard for people to, to accept that there are certain ingredients that may be, or chemicals that may um, have hazardous impacts. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mika. And Caroline, why do you think the media and news reports fail to cover many of the problems of chemical exposures, and what can citizens do to demand change? I think there's probably a lot of answers to these questions, but I wanted to start by um, telling a story which, you know, many of you may have heard before. It's um, a historical story. Um, but when um, Rachel Carson, who um, probably most of you have heard of and is kind of, um, I, I think, the person who, you know, sort of started the environmental health movement in this country, um, when she was thinking about writing her book, Silent Spring, she um, didn't want to write a book. She thought, couldn't I just do an article for a magazine? Wouldn't that be easier? And so she approached um, a number of the magazines that had published her articles in the past, and none of them were willing to publish an article about pesticides and the problems that they were causing. Um, and one of the main reasons for that was because those magazines were dependent on um, the companies for um, advertising revenue, and they were scared to publish Rachel Carson's article. Um, so that's one answer to the question. Um, another answer, I think, is that chemo chemical exposure is um, its a complicated story. It's expensive for the media to cover it. Um, uh, I um, wanted to mention that, you know, a really um, extraordinary series of articles that the Chicago Tribune did a few years ago about chemical flame retardants in which, you know, they were able to establish that the doctor who was testifying on behalf of the um, chemical industry was actually fabricating his testimony and he was willing to tell this to the Chicago Tribune reporters for reasons that I don't understand but it was only because they were able to um, devote a lot of resources to that story that they were able to uncover um, you know what the real problem was um, and 
Um, as far as what can citizens do to demand change, I, I think, um, you know, all the things that uh, people normally do when they're interacting with the media, so um, letters to the editor, uh, tweets, um, let your reporters at your local stations know when you have a story about a problem with a chemical exposure. Um, and um, uh, soon there will be more coverage of these stories. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. And Catherine, how can scientific evidence be used to influence policy? Um, this is a very interesting question, and um, I think that um, often when I first started uh, trying to provide testimony for legislatures, for example, I would think, well, of course, they're going to see the logic in my scientific explanation about um, flame retardants, and they're going to say, well, of course, we should get rid of these. But it doesn't work like that. So... Um, my recommendation is that first you have to make sure that you have a good messenger. You know, is it somebody who is unbiased? Is somebody who is trusted? Is it a nurse? Is it a physician? Is it a, you know, is it somebody with credentials that um, doesn't have an ax to grind? That's always a very important part of it. Um, the second messenger that's very, very impactful are the people who are impacted. So including on this panel the woman um, whose um, husband was um, had mesothelioma is very, very important because science um, isn't very personal and it's not very, um, it doesn't impact people emotionally and stories do. So giving a personal example and then backing it up with the science on why this is happening I think is really important for us to remember. And the third is um, health and economics. So um, the scientific evidence technically or chemically is not always very helpful, but if you can put it in terms of health terms uh, and statistically in terms of what are the economic impacts of health on this, um, for some reason economics really influences those who are not influenced by the environmental argument or even the health argument. Um, so putting it in terms of what the people who are going to be making these decisions um, and, and thinking about it in that way, I think, um, will let the science information travel the farthest in terms of giving us good impact. Terrific. Thank you so much, Catherine. Anika, how do you determine what research studies should be done and how do you use the results to impact consumers and policy? How do you assess research studies by others, and how do you take into account their financial or other conflicts of interest, and how should those conflicts of interest be considered? <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Um, and I agree that, you know, there may be many answers uh, to each of those questions. One of the ways we determine what research studies should be done is by just following the science. We have a group of probably nine scientists on staff, and we're always looking out for the latest research. Are there new studies coming out on certain chemicals? Um, if there is, that's something we, we try to investigate or do a, a report on. Also, we look at trends in the market. Are there new products coming on the market, um, and are they using ingredients that have never been assessed for safety or ingredients um, that are known uh, to to cause certain health impacts. For example, when Brazilian blowout, the hair straightening keratin treatment came out, we know that it uses a high concentration of formaldehyde, um, which is a, a known carcinogen and a very potent allergen. And so we did a report on that as, as that trend spread rapidly uh, through the population. So we will use um, trends as a way to to figure out what research should be done. Other research also internationally, we'll look to see if any um, any laws came out about minimizing or um, somehow limiting uh, ingredients at certain concentrations. We know that in Europe, there are laws against um, toxic chemicals is, is much stronger than what we currently have in the US. 
And so if they're saying that a certain chemical should be banned or restricted in some way, we'll look further into that, see how it's used in the U.S., look at the U.S. laws, and probably do uh, a report on that. Um, how do we assess the research done by others, and do we take into account their financial and financial interest and conflicts of interest? Yes, you know, uh, toxicology uh, teaches all of us that there are certain ways to assess um, a report, you look at certain things to see the strength of the report, how many people were, if it, if it was looking at people or animals or whatever the, the measure is, you look at the sample size. Um, but we also do take into account the financial interests and, and conflicts of interest. And it's weighed, you know, if, if there's a direct conflict, you, we tend to put less, less emphasis on the results of that, that report. But you also want to see if there's any corroborating data. So if another entity did a similar study and found the exact same thing and they had no conflict, then you know that would 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 also be factored in. But you al you always have to be wary of studies and conflicts of interest because sometimes you do find, for example, and this is just an example, that there's an industry-funded study that shows that BPA, for example, is safe. And all of that information out there potentially gets very muddled and very confusing for people trying to follow follow the science. Um, so you do have to look at look at those underlying issues when when looking at the the weight or the strength of a report. Great, thank you. And Nika, a follow up question: How are the processes different for reviewing chemicals in Europe versus the U.S.? And what can the U.S. learn from policies in Europe? Oh, that's a that's a great question. It's it's just a different process. Um, you know, going into how it's different is is going to be complicated and would probably take me a very very long time. I, the it's just a different law, and I must say that in terms of it depends on what where you're looking. If you're talking about personal care products in the U.S., it's the FDA, and if you're talking about other chemicals, it's the EPA or, you know, another agency. So it gets very complicated in terms of what specifically you're talking about. In terms of personal care, in Europe there are about a thousand or more, more than a thousand chemicals that have been banned or restricted, whereas the, the FDA in the U.S. has, has only banned or restricted um, 11, 11 chemicals. The law that governs personal care products in the U.S. hasn't been updated since the 1930s, and so it hasn't kept up to date with the new chemicals um, as chemicals emerge and innovation happens. In Europe, it's, a, it's different. In Europe, they also have, I wouldn't say it's a precautionary principle, but they have a lower standard for what, or a higher standard for what's allowed on the market. So if something is linked to harm, they're more likely to either ban or restrict it than the U.S. In fact, there's not a lot. The U.S. doesn't require pre-market testing in terms of personal care products. Um, that industry is basically uh, watched, overseen by, by itself. So, again, it's, it's different depending on what arena we're talking, speaking about. But in general, the, the European um, standards are stronger. Great. Thank you so much, Mika. And, Gerald, how has the Flint, Michigan story impacted the national situation regarding the identification and remediation of lead risk? Well, uh, I think it's had a, a major impact. And um, I, I think it was uh, uh, Linda Reinstein who talked about uh, the importance of collective action. And, in fact, we would not know about Flint if it were not for the parents themselves who insisted that um, the state uh, take uh, seriously their concerns about the water. Uh, we have justly heard a good deal about uh, Mark Edwards and Hannah, uh, Mona Hannah Atisha, um, but uh, we've heard less about the parents who were, I think, the real heroes in, in this story. But uh, we have... Um, gotten a real spotlight shown 
on lead poisoning as a result of Flint. And I think that that has been extremely important. Um, and part of that spotlight has shown the weaknesses of regulations and the weaknesses of the standards um, that the EPA has uh, for water. Um, but, of course, there are many flints that are potentially out there, and um, it, we're waiting for the spotlight to be shown on them as well. Thank you, Gerald. And another question for you. Lead has been banned from some products, such as paint and plumbing solder, but it continues to be standardly used without regulations in roofing products, some tile glazes, and many other products as well. Why is a known neurotoxin continuing to be used without regulation? Well, I think that the major reason uh, is uh, twofold. One is that uh, lead poisoning um, has been called the silent epidemic. It is something that um, for the most part, has remained invisible, even though uh, throughout the 20th century it is probably uh, the largest and longest-running epidemic among children um, uh, in the United States. Um, but it, I think the other reason uh, that it's been invisible is that uh, we have a situation where lead poisoning primarily affects uh, poor children, uh, children of color, and um, we as a society um, have uh, chosen not to deal with um, the health hazards to uh, this very vulnerable population. And so I think that um, uh, it's one of the reasons and probably the primary reason that we have uh, allowed this known neurotoxin to continue to be used without regulations in so many uh, forms. Great. Thank you so much. And, Nika, despite known concerns about harmful ingredients in cosmetic, sunscreen, and cleaning products, the majority of consumers continue to purchase those products. What is the best way to educate consumers about these known issues, and why are regulations not in place to protect consumers? Yes, I think that is true. The first part is definitely true. Despite um, known concerns, there are still, you know, the vast majority of people probably are still um, buying, consum consumers are buying products that have ingredients of concern. And one of the reasons that that is is because brand loyalty is a very, very, very strong bond. Um, and it's if something works for somebody, it's hard to tell them to, to move away from it especially, as I said before, if they don't see an immediate effect. And as somebody mentioned on the panel, cost could also be a prohibiting factor because the, the quote-unquote green movement, you know, the safer products tend to be from smaller companies. Sometimes they are at a higher price point, and that can be prohibitive. How can we best educate the consumer? That's a, that's a really great question, and that's one that we tackle every day. Getting the message out in front of a larger audience is always really helpful. Um, having influencers, people of influence, people that uh, the general audience looks up to and that they trust, that's really important. Having somebody that they trust talk about the issue, speak about the issue. But also having, hearing the personal stories like Linda's, I've heard Linda's story uh, a number of times and it is always extremely powerful. Um, hearing stories like that and, and putting it hand in hand with exposure to asbestos or exposure to lead or exposure to um, another known uh, contaminant, environmental contaminant, is, is extremely powerful as well. One of the things we try to do at EWG is always get the message out in front of the media because we think there is, when it gets in front of the media, more eyes will, will be on it. And the great thing for us is that we've seen so much more media attention on environmental health and environmental contamination um, over the last 10 years. In terms of cosmetics, I know that that has skyrocketed. We pulled some numbers recently um, looking at how many media stories looked at, or Skin Deep database, which is our cosmetics database, um, and talked about 
ingredients, uh, potentially toxic ingredients in cosmetics. And in 2010, I believe the number was about 115. And last year, 2015, the it was 700, more than 750 media stories on um, uh, toxic ingredients or potentially toxic ingredients in personal care. And that's just one sector. So the great news is that more people are hearing about it, more people are um, looking for information on it, but we're always looking for more ways to, to get the word out. Why aren't there more regulations in place? I think uh, uh, most of us on the panel have touched on this. What, that is the question of the day. Why aren't there more regulations in place? Um, and that's a, that's a big question. A lot of the regulations that govern environmental toxic chemicals haven't been updated in a long time. We recently just updated our, our TOSCA, Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, but a lot of the other ones, like the 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 rule or the the FDA rules for for personal care products, haven't been updated in a long time. Um, why everything moves at a glacial pace with regulation? But there's, I think, the big elephant in the room there is that there's a lot of competing thoughts and a lot of money that may be on the other side. A lot of uh, industries, um, whether it be chemical industry, they have a lot of money to invest in. They don't want things to change necessarily in, some, in a lot of cases. And so the nonprofits or the, the, the groups that are working for healthier, better, safer products may be at a disadvantage um, because we may not be able to have the same effective influence if, if we're not putting as much money behind it. But that's just one reason. I'm sure there are many others, but it that does pose a, a block in a lot of cases. Changing status quo is hard. Having companies to reformulate their products to use safer products to use safer ingredients is hard for them, and they don't necessarily want to do it in a lot of cases. Um, so they will fight against it, especially if they don't think that the science is, is extremely solid. But um, as was mentioned before at EWG, we believe in the precautionary principles. So if there's any science at all that hints that something may be detrimental, we think that it should be avoided until there's proof that it's not, but that's not necessarily the pre prevailing thought from the other side. Great. Thank you so much, Nika. And Linda, many people are unaware that asbestos continues to be used in some products and also found in many living and working spaces. What should be done to protect people from this known carcinogen? Well, Jennifer, you're certainly right. Many, most people are unaware that asbestos, which is a known carcinogen, remains legal and lethal in the U.S. But as uh, EWG and CEH have, have all pointed out, and I know Gerald too, I mean, these asbestos peddlers have been and remain very powerful, so powerful that they were actually able to overturn an EPA ban in 1989. So that's left us with a toxic uh, disaster to clean up as we've consumed over 31 million metric tons, which you can find in your home, workplace, schools. So. The, the, the biggest part for us is raising awareness because asbestos can be found in floors, walls, roof, even in your cars. Um, and NIOSH did a study, which I've heard some of your panelists comment on, about our storytelling backed with studies, which I think is very important also. And NIOSH actually reported firefighters have a rate of mesothelioma two times higher than the general public. So armed with the facts, Understanding where the peddlers are powerful, but also where their Achilles heel might be, as we go out to try to raise awareness. Uh, I think some of your listeners might have even heard recently how asbestos-contaminated talc, like, like baby powder, was found to have asbestos. And EWG and ADO have done product testing. We've actually found asbestos in toys and crayons, which is just uh, reprehensible to think that, that – um, businesses get away with this. So what can you ultimately do? That is the million-dollar question. So what we do is we go back to grassroots advocacy and the facts. So coming up with simple, uh, scalable, 
programs and campaigns have allowed us, I think, to raise awareness, like Hear Asbestos, Think Prevention. But it really, for me, comes down, and it's very personal after Bering Allen, it comes down to three important steps, that we have to have education, policy, and enforcement all aligned together to create a true, meaningful uh, prevention strategy. If we look at, um, and I know that CEH and EWG and the rest can, can cook, and I've worked together for 12 years, the reality is most Americans can't identify asbestos or manage the risk, and we're constantly testifying in front of Congress explaining that. I think one of the biggest victories that we've had is President Obama when he signed TOSCA reform into law on June 22nd. Um, I sat there with my daughter, and we heard President Obama be the first sitting president to recognize the dangers of asbestos as he signed in the new Toxic uh, Substance Control Act reform law. So we're seeing this come together, um, but I would encourage your listeners to be vigilant. When they, when they hear in the news or through tweets or blogs, when they hear, for instance, how the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Removal Act, which is uh, the acronym is AHERA, when we hear that there's AHERA violations and our students, teacher, and staff are at risk of asbestos exposure, it's time truly to share that information, and I, I believe one of your panelists talked about op-eds and letters to uh, editors. I mean, it's really to come to come forward because protecting people goes beyond the, the regulations and the laws. There is a citizenship that goes along to prevention, and that's what we found to be so important in the work. Because if you don't understand the dangers and the latency period is 10 to 50, 50 years, from exposure to possibly being diagnosed with mesothelioma, there is a true disconnect. Um, we actually found in 2007 and reported on a new patient profile that it wasn't like my husband's exposure, where Alan was 66, sadly, when he lost his life, that young women under the age of 50 never worked with, me, with asbestos were being diagnosed with mesothelioma. So I think heightened sense of awareness allows us to move prevention forward. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. And Kathleen, how can healthcare professionals become better informed about the environmental impacts on human health, and why isn't it part of current medical training? Um, well, um, that is an excellent question. Um, one of the answers that I got from uh, folks in the American Academy of Pediatrics is that um, it's not on the board exams and therefore the training programs don't want to include it in the official curriculum, which is, sounds absurd, but, um, but there you have it. So even within the health professional community, we, we need to fight to get that into curriculum. Um, I think that um, Physicians, I can't. I, I think nurses are much more progressive than physicians, <laughs> so I can speak as a physician. The medical community is conservative. They don't like to accept new hypotheses for um, causes. You know, so so the the concept that BPA, bisphenol A, in a lining of our canned foods could lead to obesity. And, and they look at me like, are you crazy? You know, of course it's because people are drinking soda and eating fast food and et cetera, et cetera. And yet BPA in animal studies show an increased propensity and likelihood of obesity. Okay, so, so it's, again, it's this, you know, complicated story about multiple factors that result in a um, medical endpoint that is hard for practitioners to wrap their heads around. Um, another factor is, um, as I, ha I, I gave a talk on toxics to a group of family practice residents, and they looked at me and they go, just tell me the one most important thing it is to share with my patients because I can't go into all the stuff you just talked about. You know, the personal care products and the pesticides in the home and radon and um, air toxics, et cetera. Um, so because it's not part of the medical system, it probably, it, and it needs to be. So there have been some movements in uh, health systems like Kaiser that will talk about climate change and air quality 
and how you need to protect yourself. Um, and the American um, – the internist group, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Thoracic Society have all made statements now about climate change um, and are – interested in figuring out how to bring that to patients because, again, if you have a health professional saying or having a sign in, even in their office or a video clip that says um, heat waves are increasing because of climate change and you need to protect yourself, here's how, then it's a really a strong statement about that. Um, so... Um, so it's a complicated area, and we are working with many groups in trying to increase the, the education to residents and medical students and in nursing programs, although I think nursing programs have more of this than, um, than physicians do. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, Gerald, lead risks are quite common in schools throughout the U.S. and the world, and it's known that lead directly impacts educational and health outcomes. What are current regulations regarding lead in schools, and why are policies not in place to test and remediate lead in all schools? What specific steps should be taken to eliminate lead risks for children in schools? Well, I think uh, the first thing that uh, we need to understand is that most children become lead poisoned in their own homes, um, and especially from lead paint in their own homes. And um, when we send our kids to school, we uh, expect at an absolute minimum that they are going to be safe there. And I think that um, part of the problem that we've had in the schools is that um, there is been very infrequent testing of the water in schools. And when there is testing, um, frequently we find that uh, the levels um, that are uh, being discovered are above the 15 parts per billion that the EPA says uh, should be the action level. And we know from the science that there is no safe level of lead in a child's body, so that if you consider that a child may be um, poisoned by lead in their homes from lead paint, and then they're getting an added burden um, when they're in school, it is really um, uh, it just uh, inconceivable um, that we as a society would allow that uh, to take place. And I think in terms of um, what specific steps should be taken, um, we really need um, more publicity about um, lead in our schools. Uh, people in communities have got to demand that their schools be tested um, and that the test results be made public um, and that um, if uh, excess levels of lead are found in uh, the water uh, fountains of schools, um, that immediately the uh, other sources of water be provided uh, to children. So this is a, a national problem, and unfortunately, we really don't know the full extent of the problem, and only community activism will um, allow us to understand what the nature of the problem is, and then we can seek to address it. Terrific. Thank you so much, Gerald. And, Nika, in addition to Environmental Working Group's Healthy Living app, are there any other tools that consumers can use to see how toxic their products are? In particular, is there a website or app that provides information on children's items like clothing, toys, strollers, car seats, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. I can obviously speak to our resources, um, but I'm sure that there are others out there. I know the state of Washington has, I think they have a, a a database for children's products in particular. But EWG does have the Healthy Living app, which is a point-of-sale app, so you can scan a barcode at point-of-sale and see the the scores, which are the how hazardous a product is um, for, for um, personal care products and food. But we also have standalone databases for those things. We have personal care, food, and cleaning products, and 
personal care and cleaning products are rated, again, based on how hazardous the product is or the ingredients in the product is. And food, we, we rate based on ingredient concerns, but also on nutrition and how uh, processed the food is. We also have a new verification program for personal care called EWG Verified, so that at point of sale, you can see the EWG Verified mark on personal care, and these products meet our highest standards in terms of of, of safety or, or health. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to even remotely imply that we are the only group that has resources like that, and the more there are, the better for everyone. Um, so there are others out there, I'm sure. Thank you, Nika. Do any of our other panelists know of any additional resources that may be available? Um, this is Carolyn from the Center for Environmental Health. Um, for people who are concerned about um, flame retardants in um, furniture and baby products, there's a lot of information on the CEH website. Um, with shopping guides and similar things like that. That's ceh.org. Terrific. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Jennifer, like, and, like CEH, yes, ADO yes. has an abundant amount of materials and resources on our website, adao.us, where you can learn uh, prevention uh, the techniques and tools and also interface with government agencies if you have problems. Fantastic. And this is Catherine. Again, Green America probably is another good source um, for purchasing and um, healthy solutions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. And Linda, what specific steps should be taken to eliminate asbestos risks? Will asbestos use and exposures ever be eliminated? Well, those are two powerful questions. I, mean, I think to eliminate the risk, we find these four points to be the easiest for most most Americans. Is one is embrace knowledge. Uh, don't put your head in the sand like an ostrich. Learn where asbestos might be in your home, schools, and workplace and community, and then you can prevent, obviously, exposure with home repairs, possibly a national disaster. A disaster. Uh, it's important that people know not to disturb or remove asbestos on their own and to hire a trained asbestos professional. But lastly, if you have a problem, concern, or violation, go to the, your state or federal EPA or OSHA agencies and, and contact them for either clarification or for action because they are there to help us. Um, and if we don't use the proper agencies, frankly, this just goes unnoticed. Your question about... Will um, asbestos ever really is exposures be eliminated? Well, we're very close to banning asbestos. We've never been closer, as some of your panelists have discussed. But working to eliminate exposures will require dedication and education enforcement from all of us. We've consumed so much asbestos because of um, our so-called need um, that 31 million metric tons remains in our world today. So will we ever truly eliminate it? No, but I think we're going to do a much better job managing and reducing risk, which will ultimately help in the public health space as well as in our environment. We still have toxic Superfund sites in the United States. Um, and it's just shattering to go and visit and see the direct connect between toxic exposures and the community. Um, so we're going to continue our work, that's for sure. We welcome the help and support from anyone else that would like to help us. Great. Thank you, Linda. And, Caroline, it's astound astounding to think that products such as lead and asbestos were so common and heavily promoted as safe de decades ago. What products are prevalent and promoted today, which may be astonishing to us several decades from now? Okay. Well, first, like the other panelists have said, it's important to remember that lead and asbestos are still problems. They're, you know, not just legacy exposure, but also they're, you know, those chemicals continue to be used. Um, the, the, the question about, you know, what's going to be astonishing to us decades from now um, you know, is a fascinating question, and um, I kind of scratched my head for a while. Um, I, I think um, 
uh, the conclusion that CEH has come to, as well as I know many other organizations, is that um, probably the chemicals at this point that um, we see as most worrisome are chemicals that have the ability to, um, for lack of a better phrase, um, mess with our hormones. Um, and the reason I think that those are particularly concerning is because um, hormones um, control, you know, virtually every aspect of um, how our bodies work and grow. Um, and hormones are active at um, minute amounts. <laughs> a little bit of hormone goes a long ways. Um, so if you're exposed to chemicals that, um, act like hormones or disrupt hormones or block hormones. It only takes a little bit of those chemicals to have a serious um, effect um, on on you or your children. Um, there's, you know, new evidence showing that um, hormone-disrupting chemicals, um, the effects of those chemicals um, can last, you know, for multiple generations. So it's not just our children, but our children's children. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, uh, we will be astonished several decades from now to think of how many hormone-disrupting chemicals that we were exposing ourselves to. Terrific. Thank you. And Catherine, do you think that the dose makes the poison, or are some of the health effects from environmental toxins independent of dose? Um, absolutely, and I think um, the previous speaker just really brought that out. Um, so if you get a lot of bisphenol A um, in your body, it may have less of an effect than a smaller amount might. Um, because hormones are designed to be effective in a very narrow range of strength. And so if you have another chemical coming in, acting like it or blocking the hormone that you want to work for you, um, it's a narrow range of um, dose or level. Um, and so the endocrine-disrupting uh, chemicals are extremely scary because of that. And unlike... Um, well, so in that class in particular, dose is not uh, related to outcome, that small doses can be sometimes more harmful than large doses. Um, in other circumstances, um, as um, the speaker spoke about lead, any amount of lead is bad. Um, obviously, larger amounts of lead are worse. Um, so um, it, it can still cause um, problems even at very low levels. Uh, so, so chemicals are, um, we used to think that the standards that we have, say, for our Safe Drinking Water Act, um, where there is a specific lead level above which is an action level, well, you know, it's bad even at a low level. So, um, so that old notion of the dose makes the poison uh, doesn't apply anymore in all circumstances. Great. Thank you. And a final question for any and all of our panelists. What are your suggestions for people to self-test the water materials and air in their homes, offices, and schools for various toxins, including lead, asbestos, flame retardants, and various other environmental toxins that we've been discussing? Um, this is Linda. Carol. Go ahead, Carolyn. Um, I was just going to say that um, CEH um, can uh, test uh, for lead, um, not water testing, but in other materials, um, paint, toys, ceramics, whatever, um, and you're welcome to contact us about that. Jennifer, this is Linda. We find it really important for people to, to not test for asbestos on their own because if they do it incorrectly, either in sampling, they could actually expose themselves. And 
and I know Gerald knows this very well, um, you can find laboratories that will produce junk science. So you want to make sure that the right people are testing asbestos so you get the proper uh, scientific analysis. So we would encourage people to, try, to hire a trained professional, professional and not be a do-it-yourself warrior at home because too many people get exposed when they go in to do uh, attic insulation removal and other things, and we get horrific emails back about those exposures. Great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for all of the knowledge and wisdom that you have shared with our audience today. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much to all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.